Welcome to you, wherever you're watching this from today, as we join together in our homes, wherever we are, as we gather as a family of God, as a Majibra Uniting Church. And if you're visiting with us, if you're watching this on YouTube, we pray that uh, this service is going to be a real blessing for you. Today, as we gather, we're going to be looking at the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we're going to see how the Lord Jesus walked alongside them, even in the midst of their grief and their, their upset. Jesus was there with them, and so he is with us. So that's going to be the heart of our message today. And so we gather to worship God. Let us worship him. Come, walk the road where the risen Saviour walks beside us. Come, be surprised by the presence of the Lord with us. Come, let us worship him, the ever-living God the risen King. Let us pray. We need your presence on the long road, Lord. The road between fear and hope. The road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we are in need of your company. Open our eyes, Lord. Take the veil from our faces and our hearts that we may see you and know your presence in your risen power. May our worship be an acceptable offering to you, the worthy and holy one, the Lamb of God upon the throne, who is ever to be worshipped and adored. Amen. I'd like to share with you from the Psalms. Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant, and you have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. You know, it struck me recently, that particular verse, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And, and how true that is for those who love the Lord. In fact, when our death comes, it is in a way a glorious thing because we know that we enter fully into the kingdom of God. I'm going to invite you to join with us in song as we share in the song, Come, people of the risen King. Oh, oh. 
lost our screen at the back so if you wonder why we might look around our data projector at the back seems to have given up the ghost this morning let us bring now our adoration and our confession let us pray eternal father god before time god beyond all time creator author of life source of love the holy one receive our praise for we are made to praise you lord jesus risen christ son of man son of god holy and exalted lord tomb breaker hope restorer life giver the one who walks beside to you be all the glory and the honor for you are the worthy one enthroned on our praises holy spirit breath of God, living presence of Christ, spirit of wisdom, spirit of knowledge, spirit of counsel, praise and glory be to you. Holy Trinity, undivided, three in one and one in three, accept the offering of our hearts poured out in love for the one who first loved us. Receive our praise, hear our prayer, and in your mercy look past our human frailty as we acknowledge before you our sin, the turning away, the self-glorification and self-worship, the pursuit of other lesser gods, the attempts to fashion you in our image, the failure to recognise your presence, our lack of trust, the poverty of our worship, our inaction in the face of injustice, our failure to love the neighbour as ourselves. We confess our sin, confident that you love us no less and could not possibly love us any more than you already do. We pray this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. We know that we are ransomed by the precious blood of Christ and being born anew through the living and enduring word of God. In this we recognise God's great love for the world, revealed in the death and resurrection of Jesus, who came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Thanks be to God. Let us now hear from the scriptures once again from the Gospel of Luke. And David's going to bring to us that reading this morning. Thank you, David. Our Gospel reading this morning 
is from Luke 24, 13 to 35, the walk to Emmaus. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometres from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognise him. Jesus said to them, What are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days? What things? he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. The man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to be death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the only one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels and told them that he is alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! How slow you are to believe everything the prophets said! Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they held him back, saying, Stay with us. The day is almost over and it is getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven disciples gathering together with others and saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. The two then explained to them what had happened on the road and how they had recognised the Lord when he broke the bread. Hey, thank you so much, David. Have you noticed if you're a local on the Gold Coast and perhaps other areas too, have you seen all the butterflies that are around at the moment? Uh, people saying, hey, that's a great symbol of the resurrection. And you might have noticed we've got some butterflies on our wall and one on the cross representing, of course, the new life that uh, comes in Christ. Well, we find ourselves in a confusing and troubling world right now due to the coronavirus pandemic. I've lost count of how many times I've heard the word unprecedented in recent weeks, but it's certainly been a lot. Apart from the issues with self-isolation, which of course can lead to anxiety and depression in and of itself, with so many businesses shut down or uh, operating in a very heavily reduced capacity, and many people are suddenly finding themselves out of work for the first time in their lives or finding their hours drastically cut. And I, along with our playgroup coordinator, also find myself in that same position of reduced ministry hours for the duration of this coronavirus pandemic. Although, of course, I acknowledge that there are many others who are so much worse off than what I am. But these are indeed stressful times, and 
The loss of income, the loss of employment are, are a catalyst for profound grief and even a sense of hopelessness amongst some folk. So I wonder if there are times when you might have felt like you've come to the end of the road. Your dreams have been smashed and your hopes have been dashed and everything perhaps seems pointless, meaningless. Maybe you even feel like uh, you know, your whole life, in a sense, has been wasted. I wonder, have you ever been so overwhelmed by sadness and grief that you didn't even see a future for yourself? Have you ever felt, perhaps, that you are walking life's journey alone? In our Gospel reading today, the two disciples of Jesus appear to be in a similar headspace. They are consumed, it seems, by a sense of grief and a sense of hopelessness. They feel like perhaps they've come to the end of the road too. And ironically, of course, they are on a road, the road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. Now, who are these two disciples? Well, we know that one of them is named Emmaus, but the other, oh, sorry, the other, we know that one of them is named uh, Cleopas and the other is unnamed. They have not seen the risen Jesus. Uh, and they were not really part of that inner twelve. But clearly they were closely connected with Jesus and his ministry. What they do know is that the body of Jesus is missing. And what we know is that they were part of a group to whom the women returned from the tomb that Sunday morning. But apart from that, nothing else can be said with certainty about this couple. Until recently, I'd always pictured this couple as two men. It's interesting, isn't it, how our minds can be conditioned by assumptions like that. I, I did a Google image search, actually, and looked up images, and guess what? Nearly every image that I found was of two men, or if one was a woman, they, uh, that one had a, a fairly strong uh, beard growth. But I, ha I hadn't really given much thought to it, but perhaps, perhaps they were husband and wife. I mean, wouldn't that what we might expect as they invite this stranger? into their home for a meal, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Some have assumed that Cleopas is actually the Clopas mentioned in John's Gospel. At the foot of the cross were Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, wife of Clopas. But the language experts point out that while the names uh, sound very familiar, they are not one and the same, and in fact this Clopas may have been dead by the time of Jesus' ministry. So sorry, we're just going to, have that left, we're going to have to let that mystery continue. Still, in reality, we don't need to solve that mystery to appreciate the very human emotion that's being expressed in this story by this couple. Here are two totally dejected disciples who feel as if their whole world has just come crumbling down. They are so despondent that when a stranger comes alongside them, it does not register with them that this is actually the risen Jesus. It takes the familiar action of the breaking of the bread for them to, uh, to see who this really was. Last weekend's gospel reading was the story of Thomas, who initially missed out on seeing Jesus and who stated, you know, I will not believe that Jesus is risen from the dead unless I see and touch for myself. Although, as I read the story in the end, when he did see the risen Lord, he didn't really need to, to touch the wounds to believe. It's my belief that the appearances of Jesus to the, to the disciples this is all part of God's plan to ensure that the story of the resurrection goes forward with confidence. Think about it. Without these appearances, there would not be this strong conviction on the part of the disciples that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. Even if they dared to suggest that without any evidence, I, I mean, imagine uh, it would be like a certain American president saying, this is just fake news. So it was important that these appearances of Jesus uh, took place. And the story of the two on the road to Emmaus is all part of that process. But it also serves a different purpose, a deeper purpose. It's a story in a different way, and it's a story that speaks directly to us. In their experience of meeting Jesus, we learn that Jesus comes alongside them. Jesus is present with them, even when they don't recognise his presence. Christ 
walks with us. He reveals himself to us. Uh, this is the meaning of the resurrection today. While not visibly present, the risen Jesus is truly with us, no matter what. There are a number of proofs of the resurrection, in my opinion. But I believe that the greatest proof of the resurrection is, that, is the fact that all around the world, millions and millions of people gather 2,000 plus years after the event to, whether they're meeting in buildings or like us at present, meeting in their homes. There are people who gather because they believe that their hearts have been transformed by the living reality of Jesus Christ. And there can surely be no greater proof. You who are participating in this service today, whether you're watching it live with us on the Sunday morning or whether you're watching it on YouTube, you who faithfully follow the Lord Jesus are among those to whom Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. Let me add to that by quoting from Frederick Buchner in uh, Listening to Your Life. He says, the earliest reference to the resurrection is St. Is Saint Paul's, and he makes no reference to the empty tomb at all. But the fact of the matter is that in a way it hardly matters how the body of Jesus came to be missing, because in the last analysis, what convinced the people that he had risen from the dead was not the absence of his course, corpse, but his living presence. And it has been ever since. Now I'm sure that many of you could share a story of your faith in the living presence of, of Christ. You know that the risen Christ is with you and, and that's why you join in worship week in, week out. That's why you go the extra mile in generosity and in service. You do it because you believe that Jesus Christ is calling you to walk with him in this journey of faith. And more than that, you believe, don't you, that the risen Christ has a call upon your life to make him known in the world. As those two disciples reflected on their experience, they noted that when Christ opened up the scriptures, it was like a fire burning within them. I wonder, does that happen to you when you open up the word of God? John Wesley perhaps did not speak of a fire burning inside him, but he did speak about his heart being strangely warm when someone was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans, which he says gave to him that deep assurance of faith, the deep assurance even of his salvation. I must look that up one day, that preface that Luther had written to see what so moved Wesley to the point that it transformed his life and his witness. But back to the point at hand. God's word is so, so important to us, particularly when we are facing various kinds of trials. There is always a message of encouragement. There's always a message of hope for us that can carry us through even the darkest days in which we find ourselves. So it is important for us to immerse ourselves in the scriptures and cling to these wonderful promises that we find there. And back to the story. Some have noted that this Emmaus story can be read as a parable about Sunday worship. After all, the story occurs on a Sunday as the disciples walk along the road, of course, the stranger greets them and the stranger opens up the scriptures to them. The stranger then uh, breaks the bread, blesses it and gives it to them. And then it is that their eyes are opened and they see the Lord. So my prayer is that our action in worship, whether we're gathered together in the, in the church or building or whether we're actually in our homes, no matter where we are, my, my prayer is that our, our action in worship to we will have our eyes truly opened to see the Lord, to see the presence of Christ who meets us, but who also goes with us into the week, whatever it is that the week throws at us. The thing that really strikes me in this story is the transformation that takes place in the lives of these two disciples. 
See how their sorrow and their grief and their sense of hopelessness is turned into this sense of joy and they rush back to tell the others what they've witnessed. Luke says, that same hour they returned. In other words, they didn't mess about. They didn't decide, oh, we'll just wait until the morning, we'll sleep on it and then see whether we should make a decision to go. No, it would seem that they just couldn't contain their excitement and they just had to get back to Jerusalem as quickly as possible. You know, friends, that is resurrection hope. That is resurrection joy. And so, in closing, if I can take you right back to the beginning, if you are feeling down, if you feel like, for whatever reason, you've come to the end of the road, when your dreams have been smashed and your hopes have been dashed, if, if that's what it's like for you, if everything seems pointless, if you were overwhelmed by sadness or a sense of grief, or if you feel like you're all alone at this time, remember this, remember this, the risen Christ is with you. He's promised always to be with you, to never forsake you. You know, that's what I cling to in these times. Lean on him. Trust him. Trust him. And he will take you through whatever it is you're going through to a joyous resurrection. I truly believe that. Amen. We're going to come now to our prayers of the people. I invite you to join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, we sometimes struggle to recognise you in the everyday journey of our lives. So we seek your wisdom in the midst of, of the questions we have about the circumstances we find ourselves in. Circumstances sometimes beyond our control, but sometimes of our own making. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you, to know your presence with us, even when the road travelled is hard, when we don't see clearly the path ahead, when things happen over which we are powerless. Comfort all those, Lord, who this day are struggling with new realities, grieving the changed circumstances of their lives, dealing with anxiety about their futures. Comfort, Lord, those battling loneliness, crying out for companionship, desperately seeking to know that they are loved, affirmed and valued. May hopelessness give way to hope, May sorrow give way to joy. May anxiety give way to peace. Your peace, Lord, not as the world gives. Do not let our hearts be troubled. Do not let us be afraid. We pray for our congregation at this time when we are physically separated and facing new challenges, that we will demonstrate genuine care and compassion, express love as you love us, and seek to support and build up one another. We continue to pray for those on the front line in this battle against the coronavirus pandemic. May they remain strong, united and protected against this unseen but very real enemy. And Lord, may we not be so consumed by this pandemic that we forget other needs and concerns around the nation and the world. Especially at this time, those still recovering from the bushfires, those still struggling against the crippling drought, and those recovering from other natural disasters like the people of Vanuatu, especially after Cyclone Harold. And finally, Lord, or this day after Anzac Day, we recall the sacrifice of many in defending our freedoms. We pray for those still scarred from war, both soldier and civilian. We pray for our current Defence Force personnel wherever they are serving this day. We thank you for their courage and commitment in serving our nation in times of peace and conflict. And we continue, as always, to pray for the day when all humankind might dwell in peace. We lift up these prayers to you, O Lord, and offer ourselves in your service that we might be part of the solution to the needs of our church, our community and our world. In the name of Christ. Amen. In my recent newsletter that I put out to, uh, to our congregation, I talked about the time early this year when we uh, were caught up in the bushfire situation down in the Bega Valley and how we needed to move to get out of that uh, 
threatening environment in which we found ourselves. And uh, as I shared with the folk there uh, in that e-newsletter, e there was a, a, an old song that came to mind for me. And I began to sing the chorus of that in the shopping centre while I was uh, waiting for Luann. And uh, it's a song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, All Fear Is Gone. And I think that's such a fitting song for us in this time to know that indeed the Lord is truly with us and the risen Christ carries us through whatever it is that we're going through. So we're going to sing that song and we invite you to join us at home. Sing along. We hope you can see the words on the screen. Let's share together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Thank you for joining us in worship today. It's been a real pleasure for us to be sharing this with you. And we pray that uh, you will have found meaning and life and energy and joy in celebrating the risen Christ today. Like the Emmaus disciples, live now as those who have met the living Christ. 
Live now as those whose hearts have burned within them as the scriptures were explained. Live now as those who have been touched by the resurrection and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you now and forevermore. Amen. And I thank all those who have helped with the service today.